Thanks, Martin. So we're here today to talk about uh, PCI Express. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and get started. So what is PCI Express? So PCI stands for the Peripheral Component Interface, um, which is really just a fancy name for basically a bunch of standards that describe how to physically build add-in cards, how they should electrically work, and how software should interface with them. So these days, PCI is the standard way that, that we end up using and basically adding additional hardware into the computer. So this is used for everything from graphics cards, NICs, for storage, video capture, uh, the USB controller actually works through this, crypto devices work through this, etc. cetera. Um, so it's pretty much kind of the, the main way that you basically have additional functionality added to the computer beyond the classic CPU and processor. So we're gonna talk a little bit about form factors, just like what is, we're talking about PCI. So here we have two images of two different PCI cards. Um, these are kind of the traditional, what are called half height, half length. Um, the full height, full height length is basically double the bottom card size. So basically you can think of it as really big, um, much bigger than fits in a modern computer uh, for full length. Um, so, but these are both kind of, these are both networking cards. These are just kind of give you an idea. These are kind of the classic kind of style devices that you would plug in to a computer. Um, some are, so, yeah. Then uh, a kind of a different form factor for PCI devices where you might have heard is M, something called M.2. So just for comparison, the top thing, the top card there is the one we had last time. The bottom one is an M.2 device. That's a Samsung SSD. That also speaks PCI. Um, and, you know, it's just a different physical form factor. It's designed to kind of mostly use in consumer products and, um, yeah, it's not hot swappable, unlike, yeah, you know, or anything like that. Um, the next form factor is you called U.2. So U.2 basically, this is used a lot for NVMe uh, SSDs, which are basically a PCI device. They take the form factor of a traditional SAS and SATA two and a half inch drive. So that way they can have various hot swap capabilities and they can reuse various components. But at the end of the day, despite the fact that those pins are different from the other pins, it's actually speaking PCI underneath. Then there are also crazy other form factors that are coming out. Um, there's Samsung's NGSFF, which is sometimes called M.3, sometimes called a couple different names, um, which is basically uh, trying to just redesign kind of what some of these uh, PCIe form factors look like for flash. Um, another variant in that is Intel's ruler, which you can see is this kind of long, wide, skinny um, device. Um, and again, these are basically just different ways to try and say, rather than trying to fit um, you know, these devices into a traditional hard drive enclosure, let's try just let's say, let's, what if we describe it, design these from scratch? So these are just different kinds of things that you'll see PCI come from. Um, you know, some of you might have Thunderbolt on your laptops. Uh, Thunderbolt is a kind of a weird hybrid where it can have PCIe signaling, can be PCIe, can be USB 3, can probably be display port sometimes, you know, depends on what it is, but isn't all of them usually. So that now let's get into a little bit of history. So um, expansion slots have been around for basically since we've had computers because you have the CPU sitting there and now you need to actually interact with it in some form. So you know, this might be, have been used for basically doing uh, serial connections you know, or line printers, you know, just any kinds of uh, different systems. Now, initially, with most computers, these were all vendor specific and relatively proprietary. So you know, if you bought an IBM uh, computer, IBM would sell you expansion cards that were proprietary to IBM. And you weren't, you know, if you weren't IBM, you weren't actually, someone else wasn't making that. So, um, with the rise of mini computers, the first um, recorded kind of at least industry standard bus was done by Altair, which was called the S100 bus. Um, you know, so this was, that was kind of the first time when we actually started having folks being able to say, I built this computer, someone else can actually sell an adding card for it. This kind of evolved with the IBM PC. Um, we had something that was called ISA or industry standard architecture after a fashion, which was a 16-bit um, bus. IBM then uh, 
created what they called the MCA bus or microchannel architecture. Um, unlike the industry standard one, the MCA bus was highly proprietary and licensing was very expensive. So it didn't really go very far beyond IBM. Uh, on the other side of the world, Spark had its own bus called S bus. So if you were building for Spark, you weren't building something for the IBM PC. Um, as people were trying to deal with kind of the changes for ISA, um, the quote unquote gang of nine, um, which was, was a whole bunch of uh, IBM clone manufacturers. These are folks who are basically making different variants on the IBM PC. We're basically saying, how about we agree to, to a standard interface that isn't one that IBM's gonna charge us a lot of royalties for. It has a bunch of other neat, nicer features. So that became what was called EISA, or you know, Enhanced Industry Standard Architecture. And then while this was all going on at the same time, on the 486, there was what was called the VESA standard, um, which was used basically for graphics. So that's how people are trying to get around the fact that these buses, you know, trying to design something special for graphics. And a special bus for graphics comes and goes a lot. So with that, we kind of get to PCI itself. So PCI was kind of first published as a specification in 1992. It replaced effectively within a few years um, by maybe 97, 98, all the use of EISA and VESA on the system. So it became fairly uniform. Um, it was a 32-bit parallel bus. So what that means is that all the different components were on the same uh, physical bus. So if you had two cards, you know, they would share that bus and they would basically be able to communic they would communicate across that shared bus. And that ran at basically 33 megahertz. Uh, an important factor, fact of this is that it was what was called fully plug and play. What that really meant was that you could plug in the card. You didn't have to go adjust jumpers on other devices, go and edit a bunch of uh, resources in the BIOS or other, other places, and that the operating system basically just kind of, and the platform could figure out basically how to enumerate it and use it. So that was a pretty important uh, thing. While other uh, specifications had support for plug and play, um, it wasn't really universal and wasn't really widespread. So, but PCI was the first one that had. So this basically drastically simplified the actual act of using cards um, in there. And it's a very important property for basically system management. The alternative was that basically you'd have to say, okay, I plugged in a card. I need to now go and adjust jumpers on these cards to make sure they don't conflict and they can all coexist. Um, which is not very uh, friendly. Another important part of PCI is that these devices could contain option ROMs for booting. So this is one of the ways that boot has been helped and slowed down for years. Um, but it was a pretty important uh, you know, piece there. And PCI itself existed for um, several years. So there's a couple of revisions of it. Um, you know, they had revisions in 93, 95, and the final one in 2004. And a lot of these incorporated different changes that were coming from uh, other aspects. But PCI itself, this original parallel bus, is actually pretty important because a lot of the aspects of it are still with us today. And a lot of things are actually still backwards compatible from at least a software perspective, even if not from an electrical perspective. The next, next kind of major take on this was uh, called PCI-X. This is not to be confused with PCI Express, which is what we're really talking about. But PCI-X was designed to be backwards compatible with PCI. It increased the bandwidth that, it, that was just at the clock frequency of the bus, so basically data could transfer faster. Um, it added a, a bunch of interrupt stuff, and we'll talk a little bit more about what those are later. But PCI-X didn't actually end up going very far. Um, at the same time, Intel, which had been a major proponent of PCI, was not a proponent of PCI-X, because they were saying, we're going to go off and do our own thing. And that was what was called AGP. Um, if you're building systems in the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, you would sometimes use this for graphics cards. And then that itself was eventually subsumed and disappeared because of PCI Express. So PCI Express um, was introduced in around 2003 and is very different from all of the non-software perspectives from PCI. So from a software perspective, we actually can think it's the same. But from a hardware electrical perspective, it's actually rather different. So one of the biggest things is that rather than having this parallel bus that different devices would basically have to share and round robin, um, which meant that as you went from having one device on the bus, you know, that was fine. I got two devices, well now only one of them can be using them at a time. 
that end up kind of being a bit of a problem. Um, instead, they basically have this basically, it's a serial bus, so it's basically going point to point. So this is connected directly to something else. Um, the other kind of big change is that rather than saying there's a fixed bandwidth for the entire system, is that uh, bandwidth is broken up into these things called lanes, which we'll discuss a bit more. And a lane has a fixed amount of bandwidth, but the number of lanes on a device can vary. So this allows you to basically say, hey, you know, if, if my car doesn't need to run at you know, several gigabits per second, it only needs to go at say 100 megabits per second, I can use a very different, you know, I can use a lot less electrical kind of connectivity, which then reduces cost and kind of is very useful there. Um, Today, PCI Express is pretty much the primary expansion slot you see on systems. Sometimes you'll still have a legacy PCI slot, but PCI Express is what's used. It's on x86, it's on ARM systems, it's on power systems. Um, some of the RISC-V cores are doing it. I'm sure you can find a bunch of other you know, systems. But if you're using anything kind of, uh, kind of the mainstay, not just data center, even just kind of um, you know, desktop, that's what you'll find. Um, and there's been four major revisions of PCI Express, which are mostly just changes to the electrical standards and throughput. And the fifth is currently in progress. So let's talk a little bit more about lanes because lanes are kind of a fundamental concept you see when you're dealing with these devices. So as so we said, these devices have a variable number of lanes and a single lane is basically a pair of unidirectional pipes. So basically one pipe, especially you can imagine for the device to transmit, requests and data, and one pipe for the device to receive uh, requests and data. And so lanes can basically, they come in basically increasing powers of two. So you can have one lane, two lane, four lanes, eight lanes, 16 lanes, even in a rare case, 32 lanes. Every lane can basically be used at the same time by a device. So basically, this is basically giving you a multiplicative effect of the amount of bandwidth that you get. As we were talking about earlier, you know, if you have different needs, you can use different lane part counts. So for example, a one gigabit NIC doesn't need 16 lanes. You know, a bunch of them just need one lane. And we'll kind of go over the, the, the size of that. However, if you're trying to get multiple ports of 100 gigabit, you're going to need 16 lanes to try and get that, that out there. So, and basically just because of this, this let vendors change the cost profile, which just helps reduce that and, um, We'll come back to in a little bit more. This also lets you change how it's physically laid out on the motherboard to basically affect what you're doing. So here's what we're talking about lanes and kind of what this means. Here's what we're talking about kind of through the generation. So original um, PCI Gen 1 um, ran a given lane at what they call 2.5 giga transfers per second. The reason they use transfers per second is that this includes parity bits. And we'll come back to what the parity is. So I've kind of translated what this actually means in megabits. So uh, those are power of two bytes for all these things. So you can see, for example, a you know Gen One device could go up to three point seven three gigabits, uh, gigabytes per second. Excuse me. And today, Gen Four is what's uh, Gen Three is what's on most uh, systems from kind of the Haswell, Broadwell, uh, even um, a lot of Sandy Bridge onward systems. Uh, PCIe Gen Four is um, has been standardized, but hasn't is still coming to market. So um, yeah, that's what we're kind of seeing there. So for example, the kinds of devices today that will use you know, X16, um, so if you have a you know, 100 gigabit NIC, it's gonna use a PCIe Gen 3 X16, so it can actually get that kind of bandwidth. It's interesting, you went seven years between Gen 3 and Gen 4. There have been a bunch of years, yeah. Um, and there's a bunch of different changes, and you know, because they're doubling this base frequency, effectively. Um, that just means there's a lot more that has to happen for the electronics that has a lot of implications for signal integrity, uh, has implications for how you physically design the system board just because if you have to go that fast and has to travel that far, um, you know, it just gets harder to do that and, it has to, and, and with the timing domains. But generally, we to think about this from a software perspective because hopefully the hardware designers have done that right. So let's talk about lanes uh, and reality. So this is all great. Now the CPU and chipset combined basically have determined how many lanes a system supports. So for example, when Intel makes a CPU, 
you know, if it's a client part, they're going to say, you know, this maybe has up to 32 lanes or this configuration can have up to, you know, so many lanes. Um, same thing with, you know, on, this, on the server parts, you know, a device can have so many lanes. When you have two sockets, each CPU socket gets additional lanes, the, you know, contributes lanes these days because these lanes are going directly to the CPU. Uh, another example is, you know, on an AMD system, you know, an AMD Epic CPU has 128 lanes. So now we only talk about devices really going up to 16X. So you have 128 lanes, now what? So basically these lanes can be divided up into different combinations and placed on the motherboard however they want. So if you look here, we have a combination of from uh, on the left of the image to the right, there's a 16X lane. So that has 16 lanes at the very, uh, the very bottom center. Let's see if, uh, then you can kind of see that there's basically an M.2 slot. So that's a 4X. Um, and then you see there's additional 16X lanes and then some, uh, those look like they're um, probably 1X lanes in between those. So you see that's how they did it. On other systems, you know, we have a bunch of 8X lanes. And even if you have a, and another proper, nice property is that even if say you have a, say you only have 8X lanes, you can still put a 1X or 4X card into it. You don't, you don't have to think about that. Um, the other nice thing is that today, PCI generations have always been backwards compatible. So I can actually put a PCIe Gen 1 device in these slots, which are all Gen 3. So, and that's been pretty important for just people sticking around and not having to necessarily, you know, over manufacture what you're doing. So next thing to kind of talk about is the notion of the topology. So we said PCI in the olden days was a parallel bus. This is kind of a point to point uh, bus. So it basically creates a fabric. Um, here, basically the CPU and memory are connected to what's called in PCI par PCIe parlance, a root complex. So you can think of the root complex as basically being kind of the um, starting point for communication with the rest of the piece of the system. So it's basically bridging the CPU and memory into PCI uh, and basically part of keeping all that straight. So um, when, for example, devices are making requests to read and write memory, that's going through the root complex and associating with that. Today, these are actually almost always part of the CPU itself. So even though I've drawn the root complex and CPU as discrete logical components, they're actually all part of the same physical device, um, which is just which is done for part of keeping track of uh, cache coherency and a lot of other aspects. Um, a lot of PCI devices are connected to a root complex, directly to the root complex. So, you know, those, those physical lanes we saw were then wired into this root complex, which is wired into the rest of the system. But there's also a notion of switches. So just like in Ethernet, where we can use a switch to basically connect a lot of different devices together and then point that to an uplink, you can have a switch um, in PCI Express. So in the switch, you'll say here, we have two devices. Each of these devices could be running at 8x. So we're using 16 lanes. And then the switch could have only eight lanes itself. So it basically will act the same way an Ethernet switch does and has the same gotchas with respect to over provisioning Ethernet traffic. Can you explain what a North Bridge and South Bridge are? I think those are terms that are likely going to come up. But they're, they're uh, the the, the North Bridge and South Bridge uh, actually are very unlikely to come up these days since they. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I just, so in the past, so there was these root complexes, um, like I said, weren't always part of the CPU. So the North Bridge and South Bridge refer to, or Intel terminology to refer to different components, basically concentrations of these components. So like you'd have things like the memory controller, how you talk to DRAM, how you talk to PCI devices weren't originally part of the CPU. So that's, and those were concentrated in these separate chips that the CPU connected to. So that was, for example, what the North Bridge was. The South Bridge then um, were, were basically things that basically had auxiliary um, components. So today when you buy a system, you know, it comes with a USB controller built in. It often comes with an ethernet controller built in. Um, while these things used to be PCI, explicit PCI devices, instead they're sold as part of the, by the CPU and motherboard manufacturer as sometimes what's called the chipset. 
Um, and basically they provide basically a whole bunch of capabilities such that you don't have to buy cards. So basically they're just standardizing the availability of these features. So this is often when you're buying you know, a system, you'll see there's audio, you'll see there's you know, USB, there are SATA ports. Those are all being concentrated. So historically those were what was in the Southbridge. Uh, now these days in Intel parlance, you'll hear that called in the platform hub controller, um, or often the PCH. Platform controller hub, sorry, excuse me, other way around. Then the other thing that uh, we haven't mentioned here is just that um, there's a notion of bridges in PCI, which are basically just bridging between two different protocols. So you can basically say there's a device that will basically translate PCI express requests into PCI electrical requests and vice versa. So this is how you could still actually have support for PCI on the motherboard or system board. And uh, yet still mostly be in a PCI Express world. And all of that though to software actually appears in it's kind of the same logical way. So we actually don't distinguish that. In the actual PCIe notion, there's actually a whole bunch of different logical layers. These layers basically are kind of describing how things work um, physically. So, from the bottom up, there's a physical layer. So the physical layer is basically transforms logical data into electrical data. So at some point, you know, when we're doing logical requests as binary, you know, data and discrete, it has to actually become analog, has to become electricity that's flowing across wires. That's what the physical layer does. Uh, the data link layer is basically taking larger chunks of data. It is basically, it's basically making sure that that link and these basically uh, lanes are actually working, that they're activated. Um, it's doing error detection and error correction. And there's a transaction layer, which basically says, um, I wanna form these logical actions. I wanna read this chunk of memory. I wanna write this chunk of memory. Um, I wanna send an interrupt. Um, I need to update this configuration. And that chops them up into logical messages that will actually fit on the bus. So you can think of this the same way um, TCP, gives you this nice abstraction of a stream, right? However, on the actual physical network, that gets chopped up into these MTU-sized packets. So the transaction layer is actually helping chop these up. Um, the data link layer is actually managing the link there, and the physical layer is transforming that into electrical connectivity. Um, next kind of thing we want to talk about is data encoding. So basically, when data is set over these wires, basically, how is that actually being done? So um, when we were talking about the different speeds, we said there was parity bits. So in PCIe Gen 1 and 2, they use what's called an 8-bit, 10-bit encoding. So you had 8 bits that basically had data, 2 bits that had parity, um, which means there was a 20% overhead, right? Because I had to split, for every 8 bits, I got to send two extra. So, um, but that you got you good error encoding. With PCIe Gen 3 and 4, and I think this is staying for PCIe Gen 5, they moved to 128-bit uh, slash 130-bit encoding. Um, now you might be saying, okay, well, if I was using two bits for error correcting with eight bits, how am I only using two bits for error correcting with 128 bits? That doesn't make sense. Um, and what they're doing is they're doing a whole bunch of uh, techniques to basically scramble that data, mix up wires that's going on, and I'll be honest, I can't really explain how it works and is still error correcting, but it, it is. So, um, but this reduces the overhead substantially, which is important for folks trying to actually drive up um, you know, how much data you're trying to send. Because you can imagine if when we were in the past trying to say, okay, we had to send 20 gigabits or gigabytes of data, it's a 20% overhead, of that, that means I'm sending four extra gigabytes per second in that world, which just doesn't, just gets really expensive really fast. So now we're gonna start moving on to the software model. Um, so everything else has kind of been the physical. The software model is what most of us actually interact with and actually have to deal with, um, aside from when we're physically pulling something in and out. So, in traditional PCI, they basically have to talk about three things, a bus, device, and function. 
So a device you should really think of as basically the physical card that you're plugging into the system. So whether that's an M.2 device, a U.2 device, you know, traditional card that you slot, plug into the slot and screw, screw in, um, that's a device. Now, each device can have one or more logical entities on it. it. Has to have at least one, which is called a function. So a function is what's actually doing work in PCI parlance. In general, different functions um, have different, you know, basically are kind of independent with most respects. Um, so for example, if you see a multi-port NIC, you know, in general, each port shows up as a PCI function, which means that each thing shows up as, as a separate device, as a separate logical thing to the operating system. Um, now, not all NICs have to do that, some don't. Um, and if you look at other devices like a USB controller or a graphics card or a, um, you know, uh, HBA for connecting SAS devices or SAD devices, those generally only have one function. Um, the functions generally have independent uh, like power domains insofar as they can be independently reset. Um, however, the whole device, obviously if you power for the whole device, then the whole device is gone. Um, so. What's ARI? Uh, we will come back to that in the future. Okay. That is, we are not on anything with ARI yet. All right. So um, then there's a notion of the bus device functions we talked about. So this came from PCI. So um, there, it's basically a 16-bit number that you can use to identify a device, a, a unique function. So there's an 8-bit bus, a 5-bit device, and a 3-bit function. So that means that the maximum number of functions you could have on a traditional device is uh, 3 bits worth. So eight, yeah, eight. <laughs> um, the bus was used to basically distinguish different physical um, devices that are there. So for example, you think each root complex that we talked about, each kind of port off of the root complex might be its own bus. However, they can still intercommunicate uh, with each other in kind of modern PCI. Um, ARI, oh, this is where you're is, an, is, it, is what they call alternative routing. So basically, it's a different way of phrasing this number. So they say is that we don't really actually care about the distinction of talking about a device specifically. So let's just uniquely number each function. Or there's only one function on this bus. Or sorry, there's only one device on this bus. So let's increase the number of devices, of logical functions we can have. And the reason that that exists is in part because of uh, doing virtualization where you want to have a lot more virtual functions. So things that you could pass through as a not quite real, not quite fake uh, entity to a hardware virtualized guest. And you want more than eight of those. The next thing is, that is, is there's a notion of address spaces in PCI. So, and these basically correlate with the processor. Um, there's three main ones and then an extra one. So PCI had memory space, so memory space is basically the equivalent of DRAM, right? So the two kind of are synonymous. So an address in memory space is an address on the memory bus. So if you're trying to refer to physical address, you know, a thousand um, from the CPU, that is the same, and you tell the device, deal with physical address 1000 in the memory bus, in memory space, those are the same thing. That's how when you're doing I.O., for example, say a NIC needs to send a packet, you'll refer to an address, say, hey, here's where the packet's data is to go send in, in memory. And the card will say, okay, this is in memory space. I can do a transaction to read this. That will go to the memory controller and the device will read that directly. Uh, the next space is called I.O. space. And this, um, basically exists to communicate with the x86 IO ports and isn't really used much for modern devices. So we're gonna kind of leave it uh, at that. Uh, the next space is actually very important. It's called configuration space. So configuration space is used, and we'll talk about configuration space a bunch, is used to basically describe uh, devices, what the device is, its capabilities, and gives you a bunch of control over the devices. Then with PCIe, they add something called message space. 
So message space is basically to allow for these messages to be sent in the same transactional fashion as was done in uh, with the others. And um, this is done for say sending interrupts, um, power management, a bunch of other kinds of uh, aspects of the device that used to be done by having independent physical wires in PCI. So um, that's not to say that there still aren't specific wires that have specific purposes on the bus, but to try and, uh, but for example, PCI used to have wires for interrupts and those have now been translated to message space. And we'll kind of go into why in a little bit. So let's, we're gonna kind of talk a little bit now about configuration space. On the right, you have an image of kind of a summary of what is in configuration space. And we'll kind of go through what some of these are in a little bit more detail. But in PCI, it's 256 bytes. So you got a UN80. In PCIe, you get 4K for configuration space. Um, there's different types of configuration space layouts. There's type zero, which is used for pretty much most things we care about, and type one, which is used for a couple bridges and other miscellaneous devices. But configuration space basically is designed to control, contain basic information about what the device is, you know, some basic control information in PCI. Um, it has these base address registers, which describe the, the different um, additional register spaces or other things, which we'll talk about in a little bit more. And then it has capabilities, which basically allow us to add additional things to uh, and describe different properties of the card. So let's talk about the identification aspect of configuration space. So there's a bunch of different things. There's a vendor ID. So that's uniquely assigned to every, anyone who makes a PCI device. Uh, there's a device ID, which is owned by that vendor. And this is used to uniquely describe a device. Um, there's a revision of that device, an ID that describes a revision. Then there's also something called a class code. So these class codes are used to describe types of devices. So for example, if you are a US, there's a class for ethernet devices, networking ethernet devices. There's a class for uh, serial devices. And so there's a different class for different USB storage controllers. Um, and in this class code, there's you know, a, a main class, a subclass, sub subclass. So you have some more breakdowns than just the uh, basic. It's not just a single digit. Then there's also subsystem and sub vendor IDs. So basically those are used that say I bought an Intel NIC and I've done some, and I, Robert, am selling it to other folks. I might have my own IDs there to indicate something about that. And then these, these IDs are all used by the operating system. So if you hear people talk about, you know, hey, what's the PCI ID of this device? Or you hear people talking about, oh, what's the, you know, is this an Etsy driver aliases? This is basically referring to how the operating system knows that this device is one that should be used by this driver. So for example, when we have the IXGBE driver, which is for a specific class of Intel 10 gig NICs, we have a list of vendor and device IDs that should, this driver should associate with. On the other hand, when we have something like the uh, USB XHCI controller driver or the SATA AHCI controller driver, we actually just use a class code, which means that it doesn't matter as long as they basically agree and implement that specification, which they should if they're using that class code, we'll attach to it. This means that you know, for um, the XHCI driver, we literally have one PCI ID that we're logically attaching to based on the class code, rather than trying to list every single vendor's XHCI thing. And so for example, Intel will have a different ID for every uh, chipset that it has. So those start to add up fast. And if we had to keep track of that, it would just be a pretty big uh, pain. So. How can we use class code? How, do we have, how many drivers attach based on class code versus? Uh, it really depends on the on class. Because really, like for example, Ethernet does, not, ethernet, it is. ethernet does not use that at all right. because each it's one is different. Each one's different. But um, USB is almost, almost exclusively based on class code. SATA, AHCI is, um, there are probably others, but. Um, the next set of things are called bars. So these bars are ways of describing uh, basically memory on the device that can be accessed. So a lot of times we'll think, oh, this device has all these registers that I can use to program and manipulate the device. So the device itself describes what those are, describes which space it wants to be in. So for example, we want to, for most cases, 
registers are basically mapped into memory space. This is how you can then read and write those registers in a normal way. Um, but things can also be mapped into IO space. Um, the neat thing is that the bars except, uh, themselves are basically, they'll self-describe how large they are. So you can basically figure out what the largest, how large, how much space they need. And the actual address that they're located at is, is, basically, uh, re, is basically reprogrammable. So as part of starting up, those addresses can all be assigned. And if something's added or removed, it can be reassigned or even changed after um, the system has started up. So this is used for different things like control registers. Um, this is used for being able to say access graphics memory or other different parts of the device. And because they're relocatable, we can basically figure, we can choose where they go in memory from the operating system. You know, if we start using a card or we don't want to use it. Um, so, uh, the next thing to talk about is capabilities. So, um, capabilities basically allow for these different uh, extensions. So, in configuration space, um, there's a for PCI. There's basically a cap pointer that said, "Hey, where's the first cap capability start?" Each PCI capability had an ID to say what it is, and then the offset, basically, where's the next capability? So, um, and then in PCIe, it's a very similar format, um, but PCIe starts at a fixed offset after, configure, after basic PCI configuration space and adds a version capability. Then these capabilities are used for a bunch of different things. So for example, um, a bunch of them are used for basically what are, what are called message signaled interrupts which we'll kind of talk about in more detail. Uh, another capability is used for advanced error reporting capabilities. If you're a um, PCI Express device, there's actually a PCI Express capability that's required to be in PCI configuration space. That's how we actually can know if a device is a PCI device, a PCI Express device, or a PCI X device. So basically, there are ways of identifying it and then giving you a lot more controls that are specific to that. So, in the PCI Express capability, for example, you have a lot of controls over the slot. You have a way of figuring out how many lanes is this device? How many lanes does it want? What generation, PCI generation speed, is it linked up at? So this basically just gives you a lot of additional control and configuration information. Uh, the next thing to talk about is basically discovering devices. So discovering devices is ultimately a platform specific means. So, on x86, there's a way to basically um, read, do initial reads from configuration space, which we can then set up eventually, once we know what devices are there, we can map into memory. But what folks will do is they'll just say something simple, like say, literally for each bus from zero to, you know, we said it was eight bits, zero to 255, for each device, you know, that's five bits, try and read function zero. And try and read the first four bytes to get a device ID and vendor ID. Um, PCI standard will say, if there's nothing there, I'll return all ones. So if you basically get F, 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 you know, 32 bit of bits worth of ones, you know that there's actually no device there. And this is a good way to basically see if a device is still there or not. Um, if you do it, if you see that function zero is there, then you'll try and read function one, function one's there, function two, et cetera. Um, but you'll only have, functions will not be sparse. However, devices and buses can be sparse. Um, so really the traditional way to do this is basically just a couple of for loops. There's, there's, there's really no other great way to do it. Um, in the traditional PC BIOS, there, wasn't, there is an interrupt, you know, a BIOS call you can do to try and ask it what the maximum PCI bus number is, um, but it also gets us wrong. And this doesn't exist on EFI. So this old mechanism was basically to say, hey, We'll try and give you an upper bound on what the maximum bus is. So you don't have to scan everything. You still have to scan, do the intermediate scan, but they also get it wrong. We've seen that in a bunch of modern systems where that BIOS number it returns is just garbage. And uh, where's ACPI factor in? ACPI is not factored in for this. It's not used at all for device discovery. It is not for PCI device discovery. PCI device discovery is done differently. Okay. ACPI can augment PCI device discovery, but it's also used for non-PCI based devices to right. be discovered. I know that, but then yeah. the, but so ACPI does not enumerate all of your PCI devices. You have to use a separate bus discovery mechanism. Um, you know, devices. 
I don't know whether it does or doesn't offhand, but yeah, sure. that's how it was done before right. ACPI existed. So everyone kind of just keeps right. doing that. Um, I think PCI, uh, ACPI can enumerate those, but there's no guarantee it will enumerate everything. Uh, for example, there's a lot of CPU specific devices, which are basically the CPU exposes things as PCI. Those usually will not show up in ACPI tables. Got it. So we're talking about interrupts. So um, the original PCI specification had basically four wires. These were called int A, int B, int C, and int D, uh, collectively called int X for interrupt A, B, C, D. Um, interrupts were level triggered. Uh, but because this is a parallel bus, you know, the CPU basically had one wire and basically say, okay, I got interrupt A. We would then have to go check, see what devices were assigned interrupt A. We'd say, hey, uh, hey the driver would say, hey, the OS would say, hey, driver, you, maybe you got an interrupt, you should go check. Uh, there was actually no way of knowing that that interrupt was for a specific device. Um, so this is why um, if you've written devices, you've sometimes seen this DDI interclaimed. This is saying, this is a way of the driver saying, hey, I actually like, this interrupt was for me. I actually had some data there. Now, of course, there's no way in this for you to know that there wasn't also an interrupt on the second device. But uh, as you can imagine, having four interrupts only for all the devices uh, is not uh, very good for scaling. Um, there's also another kind of interesting dilemma. Because this was a physical wire, it actually operated independently of a device finishing its write of data. So for example, the device, say you're a NIC, you're receiving packets, you're sending the data, you're writing data, and then you're gonna trigger the interrupt. Well, it could be that you're writing data to memory, completes, is just a little bit, even though you've issued it first, completes just a little bit after the interrupt is issued. Because that interrupt's on a separate wire, so it goes to the CPU much faster, so it deals with that. So you could actually have times where the data is actually not in completely synchronized. So this is why a lot of this was also then virtualized with messages in PCI Express. So that way they could be in the same transaction space in the same message space. So um, you got rid of some of those problems. The next iteration on this was uh, message signaled interrupts. So this translates, this basically transmits a message rather than trying to have a dedicated physical wire uh, with an interrupt vector. And this basically allowed the OS to map its interrupt vector to a single device and handler. Um, this was serialized with DMA reads and writes as we talked about. So um, in this world, a single device could have up to 32 interrupts, but interrupts had to be allocated in a power of two. You have one interrupt, two interrupts, four interrupts, eight interrupts, et cetera, up to 32. Now, just because a hardware device supported MSIs doesn't mean it had to support 32 interrupts, but that was the upper bound. However, this is still a big improvement. Um, this then got changed uh, to what they call MSI X, or just extended MSI interrupts, or extreme MSI interrupts, if you really want. Um, <laughs> this allows devices to support up to 2,048 vectors, interrupt vectors. Uh, most don't actually support that many. Uh, that's the upper bound. Uh, there's no more fixed allocation quantities. So if you want to have 23 interrupts, and you know have some prime number of interrupts that's not a power of two, you can go ahead and do that. It also required some, uh, in, basically increased some different parts of basically to, to allow for and require 64-bit addressing and also interrupt masks. So that way basically each interrupt could be independently masked. And if you're a PCI Express device, thankfully, you're required to implement at least MSI or MSIX. Uh, this is pretty important uh, aspect just for our own sanity because trying to use virtual wires and shared interrupts is a recipe for disaster. The next kind of thing to talk about the software model is called is DMA or direct memory access. So DMA is a fundamental uh, part of, and this is existing on multiple buses, but basically says the, the PCI device can access memory without talking to the CPU. So in the old days, if you really wanted to transfer memory to a device, you didn't say, okay, Hey, C the CPU would basically say, okay, I want to load in address, uh, you know, I'm going to load in address 1,000. I'll send four bytes to the device. I'm going to load in. Then the CPU, the device would say, CPU, I'm done. Give me the next one. The CPU would say, hey, memory, give me address 1,004. And, you know, this is basically do this in a tight loop, um, eating up time and resources. So 
Instead, what they basically said is, is this idea of that, um, instead we're gonna have direct memory access. So these devices can directly access it and manipulate it. So examples of this is that when we send and receive network packets, that memory is sitting in DRAM and the device needs to either read or write it. Um, so it will access that directly by passing the CPU. Um, when you're doing disk IO uh, or sending packets over USB, that's the same, that's the same kind of thing. Um, all of this works in terms of physical addresses. So this itself isn't virtualized by default. Um, with, um, and there's some gotchas with all this, right? So without the IO MMU, which is called the IO uh, memory management unit, which basically allows you to kind of do virtual, basically do virtual memory for devices, a device can access all of memory. So that's good and bad. That means if, as long as your device is friendly, it won't clobber your data. On the other hand, if your device is unfriendly, it could rewrite your program text. Um, or, you know, read any data or corrupt any data. Uh, this is kind of came very prominent in the original uh, Firewire and then subsequently Thunderbolt where someone said like, hey, I'm gonna plug in my Firewire device as you boot. And because my Firewire device can do DMA, I can take over your computer by plugging in my device or insert malware, you know, those kinds of things. So um, that's, that's kind of that. So, but that said, there's a bunch of other techniques that folks have done to try and reduce that. The IOM use one. There's some others that we'll talk about briefly. Then finally, there's just a bunch of miscellaneous features that just kind of exist on the system that's kind of worth just mentioning that will come. So one of them is called AER, which is Advanced Error Reporting. It's just basically a way for the devices to basically indicate, hey, I had a correctable error. Hey, I had an uncorrectable error. I can't, I can't continue operating. Um, and these basically just create a way for basically the operating system and the platform to work together to handle these and do something about it. So for example, if we got an uncorrectable error on a device and the platform let us, we could say, okay, we'll power off the device, power off this power to, this, to the PCI slot, power it back on and try to use it again, you know, reprogram it. Um, or, you, or the platform might say, depending on what kind of error occurred, hey, like this is so corrupt, there's nothing more we can do, sorry. You know, we have to hard reset the system. Or it's just gonna say, hey, we're getting a bunch of correctable errors uh, we want you to know about that because that may be indicative of something else going on in the system. Uh, another feature is called access, con access control services. So what that lets you do is lock down what devices can talk to other devices. So um, really there's nothing that stops a PCIe device from making a transaction to its fellow PCIe devices. In some cases, um, this is something that you need. If you're doing GP GPU work and you're trying to use multiple GPUs, you want them to be able to send transactions and messages to each other directly and not having to synchronize through software to do that. On the other hand, you might not want your NIC being able to talk to your HBA directly. Um, the next one, single root IO virtualization. Um, this is basically something that allows folks to pass through either the whole physical device into a virtual machine or uh, a logical function of that device into a virtual machine. Uh, so another kind of feature that we talk about is just surprise insertion and removal, which is hot plug. So this is uh, a lot more prominent for um, things like NVMe, where you want to be able to pull devices on, you know, traditionally. Um, not all devices, most devices don't support uh, hot plug in PCI. If you have a NIC that's slewed into it, that's screwed into a slot, and while the system's running, you unscrew it and pull it out, you will probably panic the system at best. And I think with that, that's about all I've got for kind of this high level intro to PCIe. So um, folks have questions or anything else? I know we've ran pretty long, so. Um. So uh, what is the future of PCI? I mean, are there, I mean, SRIOV was obviously a big addition in the last eight years, 10 years. Um, are, are there other big things coming I mean, the biggest things that are, that are going on there are, um, so PCI Gen 4 and Gen 5, which are, increasing bandwidth substantially. Um, the other things they've done is they've tried to standardize more external PCIe cabling, such that I could have a chassis of, you know, basically additional PCIe resources that aren't connected physically into the same, 
chassis as the CPU will work. So you see that, for example, will be used for things like GPUs potentially, where you get a bunch of GPUs that want to have a highly interconnected, uh, be interconnected to each other, but don't necessarily need to have all that bandwidth going to main memory. And that really depends on what you're doing and the use cases. And then what are some, in terms of the system support, um, I mean, we are, um, in, I mean, I know Hoplog is something that, we're, that we've got kind of on the, the mental radar. Where are, is our system software support still evolving for PCI? Um, Hoplog, and basically in uh, management is a big one. Um, just with, <coughs> I'd say management and uh, better error handling. Um, historically, PCI devices weren't designed to be removable. You know, without powering down the system and servicing them. So just the notion of how do I toggle LEDs? How do I add and remove them? How do I deal with power control? Um, just hasn't been a major aspect there. You know, in general, like, well, the device is powered on. And if it's powered on at boot, it stays on until the system reboots. And I never want to power cycle a device independently. And those are things that you do sometimes want to do for management and kind of fault tolerance and resiliency. Then more often than not, um, it's really in um, other things where we want to evolve is better um, ability to lock down what's going on on those buses. So for example, using more of the IOMU, using more of the access control services, using more of the address translation services, just to better secure the system, okay. making that easier to actually do. And then a lot of it's actually just in actual device work, the actual drivers themselves and making them more tolerant to conditions that occur, being able to actually reset them without necessarily taking down the system. In terms of other trends, um, the um, SAS and SATA seem to be going away for near line storage with that all going towards NVMe, which is directly PCI based, right? So, so right. losing SAS and SATA. I mean, not losing, it's we are gaining the loss of SAS and SATA framing, which doesn't seem to bias very much for near line storage. Um, but then having to implement things like hot plug and better error handling in its stead. Is that a fair? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, the, the error handling. <sighs> yeah, it, because it's a different model from, from how SATA and SAS traditionally have failed in the device. So just to, for folks aren't familiar. So with a SAS controller, if a SATA, SAS device is failing and that's messing up the bus, the SAS HVA, will be the one that intercepts that and sends messages and kind of do, deals with the reset. Um, and that's not on the memory bus. So you're kind of, you have a layer of isolation from that and the rest of the system. I can still give you a very bad day. Right. But- um, It's also a layer where things can go wrong. It's also a layer where things can go wrong. So, yeah. So in mid, Brian's asking kind of, what does it take for us to properly be able to use IOM and MU on smart OS? And, uh, is that a Hans question? Or? No, it's, 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 it's a, there's a lot of different things that are involved there. Um, I know it's the same so right now. It's, it, yeah, I think that's a long, slightly more involved question than I can answer right at this moment. Okay. There's, it's it's going to be a combination of both. Um, the IOMU actually doesn't not work, but there's also sometimes different drivers aren't actually sometimes rely on behavior that it uses. And then there's also performance trade offs because this now means if you're allocating memory for the devices, you now have to map those into page tables and out of page tables. Um, so there's a lot of trade-offs in terms of how do you do that and how do you make that performant. Okay, uh, if there's nothing else, then thanks everyone. Um, and uh, have a good day. Anyone who's here for VPC, I'm bumping it to 215. Eastern, presumably. Eastern, yes, you're correct. 15 minutes, 1115 Pacific, yep. So the PCI Express.